You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio, man. Today, we have another amazing show lineup for y'all, man. We have a special guest, Mr. Jerry Dugan. And man, he is someone that is going to help us get a little bit brightness in our world, man. He has an amazing website beyond the rut.com and man, he helps you not just get away from the rut, but stay away from the rut and thrive in life. Today's topic, man, we're going to just kind of keep it simple, man. We're going to talk about happiness and finding success. We're going to learn about Jerry and his amazing military career and what he's been able to do with that. And also what he's doing today. First and foremost, thank you for your service, Jerry. And how you doing, man? Oh, Shamaya, thanks for having me on here, and I'm doing great. Man, so you started doing amazing things with your military background. You uh, had experience with the U.S. Army as a combat medic, and you also were in charge of doing corporate training and all that stuff. But tell us a little bit about your military background and how that kind of set the tone for what you're doing today. Yeah. Uh, the, the funny thing is, like, I wound up in the Army because I was not a very good undergraduate student. Uh, I was doing my mom's dream, which was to go be a doctor, join the off- Army, become an officer, and make lots of money. Because, you know, she's from Thailand. And to her, all the successful Americans she'd ever come across were officers in the U.S. Army. And, and of course, that's what she ingrained in me. I go to college, didn't realize I did not want to be a doctor, but I came out with barely a 2.0 GPA, which was not going to get me into medical school, it turns out. So I needed to balance that with some experience, and I just looked at the branches of the military. Uh, they had lots of history in creating trauma, and uh, I was like, well, if I want to be a trauma surgeon or a trauma physician, that's the place to go. Plus, they'll, they'll pay for my training, and uh, and then I get to travel the world because I was a broke college kid, you know, with that college degree barely in my hands. Uh, and so I joined the U.S. Army because uh, I, I had this fear of drowning. So the Navy was out. Uh, the Air Force, even though they, it turned out they would have been the best package for medical experience, I didn't like the uniform. It's it's weird for a straight guy to say that, but I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, but I spent all my years in the Army uh uh, a little uh, jealous and envious of how good the Air Force guys had it and the training they got and all that. But that that's my fault. It was my choice. Uh, so that left the Marine Corps and the Army. Turns out the Marine Corps doesn't have medics. They come from the Navy, the whole drowning thing again. So Army it was. And that's how I wound up in the U.S. Army, uh, doing the one thing my dad said never to do, which was to follow his footsteps and join the Army. Uh, so, yeah, I called him up excited. I'm like, Dad, I enlisted in the Army dead silence on the phone. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no words of like, I'm disappointed in you or you idiot or nothing. He always had a gentle word for me. And, uh, and so he just followed up with a question and that was, did, did you sign up as an officer since you are a graduate from college? And I was like, nope, <laughs> I'm going and enlisted just like you did uh, and, and more silence. And I was like, Oh, I, I think I might've made a mistake at least on my enlistment choices. Um, uh, but, you know, they, they say God takes whatever you get into and turns it into his good. Uh, I wasn't a believer at the time when I joined. Uh, I wasn't a believer through pretty much my entire army enlistment. It was it was after I got out of the army that things started to fall into place. Uh, but now, you know, that I'm 46, I've been out of the army almost 20 years now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. November of 2023 will be 20 years out of the army. Uh, that almost. Oh, man, I could have retired. OK. All right. We'll get past that. We'll get past that. <laughs> I would have a retirement check by now, man. Okay. Well, too late for that. Um, so back on track. Uh, so how, how did it work for me? It was, uh, you know, lots of leadership opportunity in the army. Um, you know, it, it just seemed like ever since basic training, I couldn't get away from being appointed to be a leader of people. Uh, it was something I was always reluctant about doing. Uh, but yeah, basic training. I was the guy that uh, my, my drill sergeants asked to make sure everybody graduated. And I'm thinking, isn't that your job? And of course, you can't say that to the drill sergeant unless you want to do lots of extra push-ups. Uh, and I already did a lot of extra push-ups. So I, I said, okay, yes, drill sergeant, I'll, I'll help that guy graduate. And I wound up helping other people graduate. Uh, and then I go on to medic training and I think, I'm going to lay low. I'm just going to lay low and, and be a student, 
pass this course and go be a medic. And uh, day one, the cadre or the instructors pull me aside, ask me a few questions about where I went to basic training, how did I get my specialist, my E4 rank, all that stuff. And they appoint me to be a leader right then and there. I'm like, oh, son of a gun. And my, my battle buddy who went to basic training with me, he looked at me and he's like, what happened to laying low? You said on the plane, you're going to lay low. And I'm like, I said nothing. They pointed me out and they made me leader. Uh, and I wasn't a good leader. I was uh, nicknamed the warden. Uh, apparently out of all the class sergeants, I yelled at my guys the most. I uh, got challenged to a lot of fights. And that was kind of a wake up call that, you know, the, the, the movies and TV make it sound like sergeants and leaders in the military do nothing but yell at people. And it turns out it's the complete opposite. Yes, yelling is a part of the job, uh, but ultimately it was this idea of servant leadership. You know, the leader eats last. The leader squares him or herself away first behind the scenes so that when you're on stage, you're doing the leadership role in front of everybody, uh, you're taking care of your people first. You're making sure they're getting their meals, their money, their mail, uh, all the the equipment and supplies they need, uh, all the training and education they need, all the information they need, and you're lifting them up. And when they do a great job, you're putting them in for awards, you're putting them in for promotion, and when they do a poor job, you correct them one-on-one, -on -one. You, you course correct them, you make sure they do it right the next time, you're not using them as a scapegoat, you're not sacrificing your people, all the things that build trust. Um, and you know that, that helped when I wound up going on a deployment to Kosovo uh, in, in 2000. And then three years later, I'm about to get out of the army and I get deployed to Kuwait with the 3rd Infantry Division uh, with just a few months left to go. So I'm like the short timer and I'm the medic and uh, I'm supposed to get out in June of 2003. And my boss even tells me, hey, Sergeant Dugan, if nothing happens in the next month or two, I'm just going to go ahead and send you home unless you want to re-enlist. And I told him, I don't, I don't want to re-enlist. I'm, I'm good. And so, yeah, that time goes by. He says, all right, well, go ahead and pack your bag unless you truly want to re-enlist. I said, no, I don't want to re-enlist. Uh, and so packed my bags, loaded it up on a truck. I was supposed to have orders within a week. And then I'd be going back home, getting out of the Army, and starting my civilian life. Then a few days after I packed my bags, loaded it up, and waited for my orders, uh, we have a formation. It's... Uh, it's got the reenlistment guy at the front of the formation. There's like 700, almost 800 of us out in the open. And the, the NCO says, you know, attention to orders. And so we all snap to attention and he starts reading what sounds like reenlistment orders. So I'm thinking, wow, somebody's taking advantage of the tax free break for reenlisting here in Kuwait. But then I start to realize, cause I could see the front out of the corner of my eye. There's nobody up there, like with their hand raised and swearing that they're going to you know, serve their country for another two to six years, uh, there's nobody up there. And I'm thinking, well, who is he re-enlisting? And then he finally says it. For everybody who has an end of term of service date of 2003, you now have been stop lost and you have a new end of term of service date of December 24th, 2024. So 21 years out. And I almost blurred out, how long are we going to be here? And I remember <laughs> my bearing. I got back to my military you know, sergeant mode and, and stayed quiet. Uh, and so, yeah, I just found out I got stop lost. You only do that when you're about to go to war. And so all the reassurance I was giving my guys that were just bluffing Saddam Hussein, we're not really going to war. Uh, we'll all be home within a few months. This will be fine. All that was dashed because a stop loss just went in. And then I started to realize you don't bring in this much personnel and equipment and ammo unless you truly plan to use it. And that's when it, it started to hit me. Oh, we're going to war. Okay, I'm the short timer and I have to stick around. And I'm a medic, which has the highest number of posthumously given awards in the US Army than any other job in the Army. And I started thinking about all the times I was in training and in those training scenarios, how many times I died because of the things I was doing in training. And I just thought, that's it, I'm done, I'm toast. And uh, so, you know, fast forward a few more weeks, we're now on the border between Kuwait and Iraq. And we're about to invade. And I see that people are scared all around me. And I just, I think I got to get my things in order uh, because I got to put on a good face for everybody to be courageous as their medic, as a sergeant. And, uh, you know, these boys, they're like 19 years old, some 20. Uh, the, the older guys are like in their late 20s, early 30s. Uh, and I was somewhere in the middle at 27 years old at the time. 
And I remember writing a letter home just to tell my wife how much I love her. You know, we had a, a, a son who he's, we still have our son, but he's not a year and a half old anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and my wife was pregnant with our daughter on the way. And I just wanted her to know that, um, you know, I didn't know how long I was going to be gone, but I wanted her to know that I always love her and she's always top of mind for me. And the kids are always top of mind for me after her. And so it was kind of like my goodbye letter to her. But I didn't want to freak her out. So a lot of the, you know, in case I die kind of language was kept out of that letter. So to this day, she still has no idea which letter it was I wrote on March. And I know it was March 19th when I wrote it. Um, But she can't seem to find that letter. But I know I wrote it. I mailed it off. uh, So I kind of said my piece, my goodbye in a sense. And I just thought... And again, I wasn't a Christian yet. So I, I just kind of thought, you know, let's cover all my bases here, you know, just in mm. case, you know, Morales, he's a, he's a Christian and he's got, I see him, you know, he was praying the other day before we all split up. Um, let me just give it a shot. And I remember praying, God, if you're real, when I die, you're going to replace me with somebody who's going to love my wife better than I could. And who's going to raise my children as if they were his own. And that's all I got for you amen or whatever you know it was something like that like mm. I, I basically told him what he's gonna do and uh, yeah and then that night we we started the invasion uh we we bombed some towers with artillery because i was in an artillery re- unit uh in fact we were um the unit i was in the six cannons i was supporting as a medic uh fired more artillery rounds than any other battery in the u.s military uh, during that campaign, it was over 3,500 rounds, and and each one of those rounds uh, can blow up an entire football field. And so that just gives you an idea of the devastation that those six cannons, these 100 guys I was with, uh, unleashed. And I mean, our motto was "Unleash Hell." Um, and we got into Baghdad, and uh, we we did things like we were the first artillery unit to lead a. a charge into a battle zone uh since i think world war one <laughs> and it was our unit that did it then too um so a lot of, a lot of history made a lot of very violent stuff and uh you know i just you know it's it's combat it's war and i start to notice i'm going down a darker path um i'm already expecting not to make it out of this thing um and on the day my daughter's born is also the day that um, i caught looters in my compound and i and I wound up breaking the ribs of one of the guys in in that group of looters um, to, to make an example. Like, I don't want these guys coming in anymore. They keep coming back. I see them every day, three or four times a day. This will teach them. And I just remember that moment of snapping and, and kicking this guy until I heard a pop. Um, and, you know, the, the guy's dragging him out. And uh, after he was gone, you know, there was another group that came in. It was a family. And I remember stripping down the men in the family and setting their clothes on fire and, and trying to just like really scare them to let them think, this is it. You're going to die. Uh, but it, I was never going to kill them. Um, but just being that monster no, alone was enough. Uh, and somebody had come up to me. He was a young guy, 19 years old, a brand new soldier. And he had asked me, you know, what's up with their clothes? And uh, I just looked at this guy like, what? what? Like, what are you talking to? Why, why are you challenging me? You know, why, why are you questioning what I'm doing? I'm keeping you safe. I'm keeping everybody safe until I'm gone. And that, that's going through my head. And he just kept asking the same question. What's up with their clothes? Why are you treating them like this? Very gentle voice, very respectful the whole time. And the thing that stood out to me that made me even more mad at the time was that hanging out of his uniform was some jewelry, which is a big no, no in the army. Your, your jewelry is tucked away out of sight. And at, it just fell out. It wasn't like he did it intentionally, but it was a gold chain and it had a small cross on it. And I'm fixated on the fact that he's out of uniform regulations. And I, I just feel myself getting madder. And I remember saying something to him that one disappointed him, I'm sure. And it was like, you can either help me pull security on these guys or you can help them rebuild the wall they tore down. Uh, what do you want to do? And he just kind of resigned at that moment. He said, you know, I'm just going to go back to my unit. Sorry, I bothered you. And, and he walked away. And it, 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 that was enough, though, to catch my attention. And I wound up letting that family go. Um, I got some other guys. We, we rebuilt that wall that was torn down ourselves. And I went back to my hooch or my little room that I was assigned to in this compound in Baghdad uh, after, after we'd gotten into Baghdad. 
And I remember I just broke down and cried because this is the morning, the day that my, my daughter is being born. And here I am being the worst person I've ever been in my life. And I remember crying out like, my daughter cannot have a father who was a monster. She just can't. And I know I'm not going to make it out of here, but uh, from here till the day I'm gone, I'm going to be the best man I could be. And, and so that was my line in my, it was more of like another line in the sand for me. Cause I, I drew another one when I was 14. That's a whole different story. Um, but that changed everything, how I treated people in the combat zone. Um, you know, I apologized to the soldier who, who con, you know, contacted me and, and kind of called me out, uh, and he forgave me. And, uh, so I managed to get it out of there. You know, it was, that was in uh, June when all that, no, no, April, because that's when my daughter was born, April. Uh, June, July, we get pulled out of Iraq back into Kuwait because uh, apparently our brigade was uh, a little too fine of a razor for doing peacekeeping operations. We were, um, you know, the, 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 the brass just wanted to get us home. The politicians wanted to get us out of there. Um, and the press was just like, it's just a matter of time before these guys go above and beyond and just like slaughter a bunch of people. And and so they, they got third brigade, third infantry division out of there. And I'm sure they won't say it that way, but I mean, I, I was there. <laughs> uh, and, and so it was just a choice there as well. Like I, I needed to choose for my daughter, for my son, for my wife, um, to be a different man. Um, at least so that the memory that they had of me was different than what I was becoming. Um, now what I didn't know, is that while I was in Iraq the entire time, so I, I made my deal with God when I was still an atheist on the first day of the of the, the invasion. It turns out every day for the entire invasion, my wife was making a deal with God, and that was, if you bring my husband home in one piece, I promise you I will make sure he goes to church, and the rest is up to you. And so the day I got home, it was at 2 in the morning. Uh, we got off the bus, went into a gym. There was an army band there playing um, Proud to be an American. And then they played our um, division fight song because, you know, army units have fight songs just like colleges. Mm-hmm. And got reunited with my wife, I, I, my son, got to meet my daughter for the first time. She was three months old. We're driving back to our home, and my wife tells me, Jerry, I got, I got a confession I need to tell you. And I'm like, please tell me it's new furniture. We got new furniture. We got new furniture. Because our, our chaplain had told us, uh, all that money you thought you saved up tax-free while you're in the combat zone, your wife spent it. So um, either A, you got new furniture, or B, she got a new boyfriend. Um, if you got new furniture, you say thank you, you hold her tightly, and you just be grateful you're home. If she got a new boyfriend, you call me, the chaplain, and here's my phone number, and I will help you. I'll take care of you. I'll get you through this. It'll be okay. Um, and so I'm like, you know, please be new furniture. So I asked her, like, was it new furniture? She's like, oh, yeah, we got new furniture. But that's, I was like, oh, good. <laughs> uh, and then she said, but, you know, that's not what I got to tell you. And then, and so then she goes on to tell me that she made a deal uh, with God. And, and I said, well, if that's the deal you made, then that's the deal you made. I, I can't make you a liar to God. Um, and so, yeah, I sat with her in a church every Sunday, uh, looking for any reason to get out of there. Like, you know, Hey, our kids are crying. I'll go. Uh, Hey, they, they said that our kids are crying again and I'll go. And, and my wife started to catch on to that. She said, no, we'll, we'll take turns. I go once you go once. I'm like, okay, got it. We moved to Corpus Christi. I get out of the army and, uh, we, we find another church home there. And, uh, yeah, in 2005, uh, that church catches on like, Hey, this dad, this dad is always getting out of service to hold his daughter. What if we had a volunteer just hold him? And, and so they did. And so I wind up receiving Jesus as my savior, like in 2005, I become a Christian and I never looked back. And, um, you know, when I look back at my life, it's like all these things that happened, you know, everything from like when I was 11 years old, seeing my parents divorce, my dad attempts suicide, uh, between 11 and 14, being bullied by my cousins and a couple of my uncles, uh, being called gook or half per half breed boat person. Um, you know, all the all the things that a good hardy white family tells their their uh, biracial you know relative, uh, you know, going through high school in poverty, uh, barely getting through college, going through combat, um, that you know if I if I focus on something positive like Jesus Christ and the the good that God intends for people, then nothing else matters, and and I can actually let my hardship become a testimony to glorify him. And I just let it all go. 
And when I do that, it, it's weird. Like, you know, whatever stress I'm feeling, whatever emotion that's got me bogged down, if I just let it go and, and think about the positive and the goodness of Jesus, and it, it's just so weird. It sounds hokey when I say it out loud, but when it's happening on the inside of me, it's like, you know what? There isn't anything to worry about. And, and as soon as I recognize that, any solution that I need kind of pops up in my head. And it's like, oh, I have what I need to do the next thing I need to do. Okay, great. I have what I need that matters most. My family is around me. Um, we still have a roof over our head. You know, there were a couple of times during the recession that we almost lost our house. And we were able to save it every single time until it was time to sell the house and then use that money to pay off all our debt. And, um, and so, yeah, if you asked about my army life. That's kind of the whole thing right there. <laughs> <laughs> man, that's awesome. We, we're going to have to have you back on, man, because we only have like four. We only have like three minutes left, but real <laughs> fast, man, real fast. If you don't mind, I would love to have you back on. Yeah. But, um, you real quick for the audience. Uh, I mean, you basically told the whole story of choosing happiness right there. I mean, you you chose it. You kept following the path that led you to all these different opportunities and you chose to make the best of each opportunity. So when you speed forward to you being the CEO and senior consultant of BTR, and, and that's just short for beyond the rut, that is kind of, is that, I ask you a question, is that kind of basically the lifestyle you, you're, of your platform? You're, you're presenting basically everything that you have learned with your experiences and you're yeah. helping people. Yeah, so Beyond the Rut, the podcast is about living that that whole life, uh, looking at your faith, your family, your fitness, finances, and future possibility. Uh, and then how do you have a successful life in all those areas where they're all interconnected, they're all aligned, one helps the other, and you recognize if you're falling short in one area, it's going to impact all these other areas. And so like, how do you pursue your career or your business and not lose your faith or your family in the process or lose your health in the process? So that's the basis for Beyond the Rut. Uh, and then I started a company uh, back in November of 2022, uh, taking my leadership development experience and my leadership experience uh, with the so it's BTR Impact is the business side of Beyond the Rut. Mm -hmm. And the focus with BTR Impact is to help grow and develop servant leaders who have a beyond the rut impact with the teams they lead, with the families they are a part of, and the communities they live in. And uh, so it's that whole person approach to leadership, uh, bringing their best selves, bringing their whole selves, being human centered when they lead others, um, you know, because not everybody's going to be a follower of Jesus. So they can at least be human centered as they do this. And uh, so that's BTR impact doing, doing leadership coaching, excuse me, leadership consulting, leadership training. And then the other half of BTR Impact is the podcast, which is how you and I connected um, as well. And one last question, because I got to have you back, man. I feel like we just started this conversation. But uh, real quick, before we let you go, when you look at uh, the individuals who are serving the military today, if you can take one thing away that you learned from uh, the Army well, some of the, uh, or what's a leadership lesson that you found was very uh, impactful for your life? It was something that uh, Lieutenant Perkins had told me when I was deployed with him in Kosovo in a small town of Partesh, because uh, he knew I was putting a packet in at the time to go to officer candidate school. I didn't get in. But this piece of advice that he gave me uh, still sits with me to this day. And he said, hey, hey, Dugan. As long as you take care of the three M's for your soldiers, they'll take care of the mission. I'm like, what are the three M's? He said, as long as you take care of their money, their meals, and their mail, they will always do what they need to do to go take care of the mission. So take care of them. Trust them to take care of the mission. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And ever since I applied that, every time I've applied that, um, you know, just trust your people, take care of your people, and they'll take care of the mission. They'll take care of your customers. They'll take care of your bottom line. And it works every time. You've been listening to Army Focus Radio talking to Jerry Dugan. He is the CEO and senior consultant of BTR Impact LLC. Go to his website and listen to his podcast, Beyond the Rut. It's beyondtherut.com. Man, Jerry, this was the fastest 30 minutes of my life. If maybe one day you come back, I'd love to have you back on because I feel like we just kind of skated by in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That'd be an honor. <laughs>